I have two containers that have uh, certain substances that uh, we'll see if you can identify. Um, first of all, can you include your left, your right nostril? Can you smell anything? Um, faint smell. But can you identify it? No. Okay. There's another container. Can you smell anything? No. Okay. Let's go ahead and include the left nostril and let's test the right nostril. Can you identify or smell anything? No. Okay. And now can you smell anything in this container? No. Okay. This container had orange fragrance and this one had coffee. I want you to read the smallest numbers that you can. Which line can you read the smallest? Six, five, four, five. Okay. Can you read the smaller line? No. That's the smallest line you can read. So you're reading the, yeah. the um, 20 over 70 line. Yeah. Let's go over here. Can you read the smallest line? Which is the smallest line? Four, two, eight, three, six, double, you, okay. E, um. Okay, so that, can you read the next smaller line? No. So I was reading it 2040. Okay, thank you. The first photograph is of a fundus showing papilledema. The findings of papilledema include loss of venous pulsations, swelling of the optic nerve head, so there is loss of the disc margin, venous engorgement, disc hyperemia, loss of the physiologic cup, and flame-shaped hemorrhages. This photograph shows all the signs except the hemorrhages. The second photograph shows optic atrophy, which is pallor of the optic disc resulting from damage to the optic nerve from pressure, ischemia, or demyelination. This young man has a resolving optic neuritis, and you can see that he has an afferent pupillary defect on the left. We're putting a small filter over the right eye to try and balance that defect, and you can see that when the light is shined in the left eye, there's still a dilation, indicating that there's not enough filter placed over the normal eye. Now 0.6 log unit filters placed over the right eye. And again, you can see that it's not quite large enough to balance this defect. I want to point out that in between each testing, what you need to do is to re-bleach the amount of light entering both eyes, as I'm doing here. And that's to prevent any asymmetric bleaching of the eyes while the filter has been placed over it. We're getting close. Here's the baseline exam. There's bilateral ptosis, and you'll see that there's bilateral duction deficits as well. Patient is apparently fixating with the right eye, and there's a left hypertropia, but the vertical ductions of that left eye are impaired as well. Open your eyes wide. Okay. All the way over, all the way back, all the way over and up and down. Coming back. Over. Okay. Look over here. Quick look over there. Okay. Quick look over here. 
Yeah, come on, Dan. We're going to show you here an example of a third nerve palsy. Now, this is a relatively young patient who had acute onset of a third nerve palsy and when worked up was found to have a dolichoectatic basilar artery. Most likely it was compressing the left third nerve because this pu patient had pupillary involvement. The pupil is relatively involved on the left side. Going through ductions now, you can see that that left pupil doesn't medially duct, doesn't infraduct well either. And see that it A B ducts quite well, six nerve function, and superduction is obviously impaired. Look here in forward gaze. All of these saccadic intrusions are not nystagmus. They're actually square wave jerks. There's a fast phase that takes the eyes off of the target and another fast phase that brings the eyes right back to primary fixation. And this differs from nystagmus, which have an initial slow phase. So these are actually saccadic intrusions. Now watch Pursuit. Pursuit is a little saccadic. It's not smooth. Now we're going to show you saccades. Little slow, little inaccurate. But again, you can see fixation is disrupted by these continued square wave jerks, these saccadic oscillations. They're called oscillations when they're relatively continuous and intrusions when they're intermittent. Now here we're showing that the patient with Dow's head maneuver actually has a fairly full vertical movement of the eye. Okay, just watch. Each new shape is going to come right here. Okay. Do it one more time. Just right here. Then watch each new shape as it goes the other direction. Okay. Watch each new shape. Okay, let's do it one more time. Okay, watch each new shape. Okay. okay. Watch each new one. Okay. Let's do it one more time. Again, just watch each new shape. Okay. Just do it again. Watch each shape. Good. Now we're going to go to the other direction. We're going to go to the left. Just watch each new shape. Good. Okay. Just watch each new shape as it comes up. Okay. Do it one more time. Just watch each new shape. The vestibulo-ocular reflex should be present in a comatose patient with intact brainstem function. This is called intact doll's eyes, because in the old-fashioned dolls, the eyes were weighted with lead, so when the head was turned one way, the eyes turned in the opposite direction. Absent doll's eyes, or vestibular ocular reflex, indicates brainstem dysfunction at the midbrain pontine level.
11 hour guy rabbits and pupil in a patient with neurosyphilis. You see, with light being shined in either eye, there's minimal, if any, constriction of the pupils. Not a very con convincing light response, but look how small those pupils are to begin with. That's characteristic of an Argar rabbit's and pupil. Now what we're doing is turning the light on and off. And again, I don't think there's any convincing pupillary response. What we're going to do here is to ask the patient to look at the finger as it approaches his nose, evoking his near response. Now look, those pupils are constricting to near. What you can see is when he looks off in the distance, they dilate, proving that they were constricted to near. Here we go again. Watch those pupils. I think you can see them constricting a bit. So you feel better on this side. This yes. side would be normal. Exactly. Around my eye, I feel very well on the, on the right side. And how, but this is different oh, no, here, it different, here, it's different. And here. My skin feels like sunburnt. Okay. I'm going to have the sharp object. Does this feel sharp here? Yeah. And here? Yes, it feels here. sharp. Any difference there? Uh, and no. Down here, no. down here, the same. The same. Here. Totally normal. Yeah. Okay, how about over here? Feels numb. No, okay, yeah. different. It doesn't feel as sharp then. It feels sharp, but as if the skin had been numbed with drops or uh, okay. shot or whatever. Okay, and is there any difference here versus uh, here no. versus here? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, this side is a little, it hurts a little bit more. Okay. You tell me when it changes, okay? Okay. Sharp. Sharp. Mm -hmm. Sharp. It goes numb. Just After the there. eyebrow, it sort of... Um, just over here. It leaves me a feeling like you had just uh, touched it with something very hot. Okay. Tell me when it changes coming across. Yeah, after the nose, it's not right there. Yeah, okay. it starts. Tell me what it changes here. Uh huh. It's it hurts on the right uh, left side of my lip. It hurts. Okay, so say now as soon as it changes. Uh -huh. Now. A patient with an absent corneal reflex, either has a cranial nerve five sensory deficit, or a cranial nerve seven motor deficit. The corneal reflex is particularly helpful in assessing brainstem function in the unconscious patient. An absent corneal reflex in this setting would indicate brainstem dysfunction. You're going to relax a little bit with your jaw. I'm just going to tap here. Just relax totally. Let it go close. No, there you go. Open it just a little bit. Okay. Have a positive jaw jerk. Can tell you something? Uh, sweet. Sweet. So mm -hmm. you tasted it before you put your tongue back in? 
Yes, okay. I did. Okay. But ahead. towards the center of the tongue. Okay, that's fine. Just and I'm going to take out your tongue now again. Uh -huh. Okay, and again. See if you decide what it is before you put your tongue back in. Do you decide? Mm. Is it harder? It. It is. Can you hear that there? Hear it over here. Harder to hear over there? Okay. All right. Can you feel it in the middle or to one side? Feel it over there? Okay. All right. Which, can you feel it back here? Okay. Tell me when it stops. It stopped. Can you still hear it? Okay. Tell me when it stops over here. Can you hear it? No. Patients with vestibular disease typically complain of vertigo, which is the illusion of a spinning movement. Nystagmus is the principal finding of vestibular disease. It is horizontal and torsional, with a slow phase of the nystagmus toward the abnormal side in peripheral vestibular nerve disease. Visual fixation can suppress the nystagmus. In central causes of vertigo, located in the brainstem, the nystagmus can be horizontal, upbeat, downbeat, or torsional, and it is not suppressed by visual fixation. You got your tongue all the way out. And again, we're just gonna okay, and then all the way out as, as far as you can. See if you can get all the way out of your chin. Your good. I want you to move your tongue over here to the left, to the right side. I want you to move over to the left, over here again. And over here again. Okay. And I want you now to stick it all the way out. And I want you to push against the tongue blade. And I want you to push over here, the other side now. All the way over here. And only push it back. Push it back. Okay, and over here again. Only push it back. Push it back. Okay, good.